Shalom, shalom. We're going to touch on Yeshua. Yeshua is I and I high priest. All right. Rastafari high priest after the order of Melchizedek as Yeshua ha Moshiach. All right. That is the Christ, the Messiah, the Moshiach, the Bain ha Elohim of Kedamawi Haile Selassie of his Imperial Majesty, I and I, Abba Father. So let's continue here. We had left off. In speaking about the sacrifice, right, and the sacrifice of the animal, right, the blood of the animal. And let's bring this up right here, right? So we have the blood of the animal. Now, the question right there is Yeshua, or is Jesus our Easter lamb or is he our Passover lamb? Well, that's fine. I wonder more, you know, and we know that he is our Passover. We know that Easter even being in the King James Bible, right, was a uh, sorry uh, insert, right, a sorry insert for what it really should have been, Pascal, right, Pascal, the Pascal, the Pesach, the Pesach, speaking of the Passover. Mm -hmm. Amen. So let's touch on this right here, since we had left off on touching on the word Kofur, Kopar, Kapur, like in Yom Ha Kippurim, and the meaning to at one, to atone, right? To atone for by offering a substitute, right? And how the priestly ritual, right? The old ritual of the, of the Lewawi and the Levites was concerning the sprinkling of the sacrificial blood to remove Chatiyat or defilement, and that was called the Tahora. The Tahora, or the, we say Balmarinya, we say Teru, Teru, right? Teru, right? Which, which is the, from the same Afro Shemitic root. Ethiopic is a Shemitic language. There's a mystery to Ethiopia. I want to say Ethiopia is Hamitic, but really that is not completely true, right? Ethiopia, Ethiopic is Shemitic. There's a, there's a mystery concerning Ethiopia in that regard, but it's connected with the Aleph Tav. Right, the Alpha Omega or the at one man's top, right, at one man's cross in reference to Yeshua. So as we move forward, we find that the lifeblood of the sacrificial animal, right, it was required in exchange for the life blood, right, because life is in the blood of the worshiper. This is where the expression, the symbolism of the expression of innocent life given for guilty life. Now the symbolism here, right, is further clarified by the action of the worshiper in placing his hands on the head of the sacrifice, or what's known as the semikha, the semikha, right, the semikha, the semikha, right, the semikha is the placing of the hands, right, on the head of the animals, right, of the animal. Right, and when you place both hands, it's like that trinity, if you can receive it, and confessing, right, his sins. So when you would offer, if you would offer your lamb or you would offer your sacrifice, what you would basically do is bring that animal there and you would place your hands on that animal and you would confess the reasons, right, the wrongdoings, the violation of law or, or whatnot, whatever you were guilty of over that animal, according to Leviticus 16 and 21, right? Leviticus 16, 21, but you also find that in the first part of Leviticus 1 and 4 and 4 and 4, which was then killed. Then that animal was slit from ear to ear and it was sent or it was sent out, right? It was killed and, 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 and burned, like consumed within the, 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 the tabernacle precincts, like in, in the courtyard, or that animal was sent out as a scapegoat. Now, the the root word or the shoresh also appears in the term kaporet. Right, the kaporet is interesting because the kaporet, right, refers to what we have here. Let's see if we can bring this back into play right here. What we have here, right, as the mercy seat. Right, so let's do this right here. Let us uh, grab this, right, so we can focus on the kaporet. So we can really have a good, a Hebrew, right, or HD, 
what you call the Hebrew definition. This is the HD right here, getting into the Hebrew definition, right? So here would be the, right? This would be, right? This would be the caporet, right? Right? That would be the caporet right there. Now, what is the caporet? Let's move this over right here, right? Let's move that over so we can just space this out a little bit more, right? So we have this here, we have this, and let's do it like that. So what would be the caporet? The caporet, right? The caporet is the mercy seat. So we have the caporet right here, the mercy seat, right? Which is on top, right, of the, of the box of the ark, right, of the tabo to the Ha'aron, right? So we have the mercy seat. So this is the mercy seat, the angels, or the cherubim, actually, the kirubel, or the kirubim, with their outstretched wings, right, as we find it right there. So we get a good view of that right there. So that's the mercy seat. Now, why is the mercy seat, what is the role of the mercy seat? So if we say we're after the order of Melchizedek, right, then these are some of the basic elementals that we, would, we should need to become familiar with. We should understand, well, this is what it was. This is how it went. This is the reasons why this is such and such. It's very important for us, right, especially those who call on his name and we recognize and identify him as I and I, Abba, Father, with all due diligence to study to show I and I ourselves approved. And this is what this HD study, right, is all about, right? The Rastafari I and I High Priest after the order of Melchizedek is Yeshua, is Yeshua's Christos. This is according to the teaching of his imperial majesty. Right? He said, for my part, I glory in the Bible. So if we seek to bring glory to him, then no doubt, what is the connection or the role or the response ability to studying the Bible? Yes, there's a lot of false ideas, right? And a lot of false doctrines and dogmas and man-made opinion that has gone out there. But that should not deter us from our quest and our acquisition and our liberty and dwelling in and the indwelling in us of the truth. Amen. Amen. So let's go forward right here. Now, this uh, the root or the Shoresh of uh, uh, Kippur, Kapur, Kafar, Koper, Kofar, all refers or also refers, also appears rather in the Hebrew term, kaporet, and that is so-called mercy seat. So what is so-called the mercy seat, right, is the kaporet, right? But a better rendition of the mercy seat would simply be rendered or interpreted or translated as the place of atonement, right? The place of atonement. The place of atonement is this mercy seat, right? This mercy seat right there. That's the place of atonement. Now, the caporet was the golden cover of the sacred chest in the Holy of Holies of the Mishkan or of the tabernacle. Or later on, it became of the temple, right? Later on, it became of the temple where the sacrificial blood, the blood of the animal, of the animal creation, was presented life for life on behalf, right, of, of the worshiper, right? So we have Leviticus um, 1711. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to atone for your soul, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. It is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Now, in the Hebrew, uh, ki nefesh, ha basar, badam, hi va'ani, natati lechem, al ha misabiach, le kapiar, or le kapar, Al naf shotekem ki hadam hu be nefesh ye 
chaper, je kapar, je kapar. Vai, so benefesh, je kapar. Vai, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Vai, by the life. Ba nefesh. Vai, so, that's Leviticus 17, 11. Now, the message, right, of the center book of Torah. The center book of Torah is Lewawiyan, Leviticus, right? So Leviticus is that central book in the Torah, in the Orit, Ze Lewawiyan, Orit Ze Lewawiyan, is that since Ha Elohim, Baruchu, is Kedus, Ha Kadosh, Ha Shalosh, Ha Kadosh, we must be holy in our lives as well. And this means, first of all, being conscious, right? Having a, con a consciousness of the distinction. We need to know what is the distinction between the sacred, the kedus, and the profane, the urkus, right? The sacred and the profane, right? The clean and the unclean, that which has value and that which is of no value and so on. You are to distinguish, right? This is the key word here from Leviticus 10.10. 10. You, we are to distinguish, make distinguishing, distinguishment between the holy ha kadosh and the common ha chol, ha chol, ha chol in the Hebrew, ha chol, or we say arkus, rikus, the rikash, right? And between the unclean, right, the ha tamei, and the clean ha tahor, right? The ha tahor, right? Amen. Now, also refer to Ezekiel 44, 23, right? We can also compare Leviticus 10, 10 with Ezekiel 44, 23. Don't have time to go up into that right here, but it's interesting because Revelation also speaks the same way, right? To make a, distinct, a distinction, then they'll return and make a distinction, right? Between the holy and the profane. In fact, let me get this word in Revelation. Right, because Revelation also speaks this way, and Revelation is just that. It's an uncovering of something that was before unknown or a mystery. Doesn't mean that it was not, but it was not known. It was not revealed. So it says right here, verse 10, 22 and 10, And he saith to me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is, verse 11, he that is unjust... Let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, sadik, let him be sadik still. And he that is kedus, holy, let him be kedus, let him be holy still. So that verse twenty two eleven also has a a a a a um a resonance with Leviticus 10.10 10 and Ezekiel 44.23. So just as Ha Elohim, right, Baruchu, he separated the light from the darkness in Orita, Zefitret, or Bereshit, Genesis 1 and 4. So we, so I and I and we are called to discern between, to have discernment between, which is known as being, right, or beyond, being, Right or bain, right? Bain, bean, bean, like like Malaku Bian, Bayan. It comes from the same root. Just putting that there for the Talmudim to study up on that a little bit more. The word to, to being discerned. Right? Bayin, Bayan, Bayan, Bean, you know, discernment, like proper judging, you know, but really judging in the sense of discerning. Not so much acquitting or condemning, but discerning. The realms of the holy and the profane, the sacred and the common, and the clean and the unclean. Indeed, Bonet in the Torah, right, it states that Ha Elohim he called the light day, and the darkness he called Koshet or night, thereby associating his name with the light. So he associated his name, Elohim, with the light and not with the darkness, Genesis 1. And five. Now, when we spiritually understand this, the tabernacle, the Mishkan, or the Dinquan, the Deptera, right, physically represented the separation between the realms, as may 
you know, be illustrated. And there's a there's a diagram here. I want to see if I can show you this diagram so you can see this uh, discernment right here, right? This separation, you can pause it right there, right? The holy, the clean, and the unclean. All right. Awo, awo. Okay, so in moving forward, let's move forward because we didn't get to the, the real, well, this is all the real part of it, but let's go on right here. But the part that we want to really touch on right here um, is more about the Kahin HaGadol. But we need to understand, well, what was going on, right? And now how has this been fulfilled, right? How has Yeshua, HaMoshiach, how has he fulfilled, right, this uh, sacrificial type, right, to be Abba or Father's lamb, the lamb that he has provided, right? And now how did the high priest, who Yeshua is in his ascension, right, offer that blood, right, in the true tabernacle, which the earthly is only a copy, right? It's only a copy of that, like almost like a teaching tool. So we have to go to the word sacrifice, because sacrifice is korban, korban, the word korban, right? Some of you might know korban like a drink, but korban is a sacrifice, or korban, right? Korban, which comes from the root uh, kerev, or, or karov, they would say, kerev, kerev, which means to draw close, makrev, to offer, all Ethiopic, Amharic, and Afro-Shemitic roots, to draw close, right? Or to come near. I mean, after all, Moses, right? Moses, his Ethiopian wife, so we see that Ethiopian connection, so no doubt we can find the true roots within the Amharic and in the Ethiopic as well. So we have Karov, Karov, or Kerev, Kerev, right? Kerev. The uh, like to offer, to draw close, to come near. Now, in the tabernacle, we have the korbanot, right, which were various ritual acts that were offered upon the altar to cleanse the unclean sinner, so that he or she could draw near to a holy, a kedus, a holy Elohim, a holy God. Because of this, Elohim instituted the sacrificial blood as the cleansing agent that purified from the effects of chatiyat, of the sin nature, of defilement with the world, flesh, and the devil. Leviticus 17.11, Hebrews, compare that 17.11 from Leviticus of Hebrews 9.22. We can also see that the general process of purification by considering the case of the Metzora, the Metzora, the limbs that way, or the leper, as described in an earlier chapter in Leviticus, Leviticus 14, in a ritual that somewhat, when we study these two rituals, the cleansing of the leper, right, we can see that these two rituals somewhat resembled the, the elaborate Yom Kippur ritual that is performed by the high priest. So this is interesting too, because we find that within Yeshua's earthly ministry, because it's a heavenly ministry, but in his earthly ministry, what did he do? He cleansed the leper. And we know that the old time leprosy is where a so-called original black skin melanated person lost that, whether they call it vitiligo or they have different names for it today. But basically, we know that is changing from the creational black skin or Ethiopic or black complexion to a white one as if by disease. We're not speaking of white folks nowadays. Most of them, generally speaking, are clean lepers. It's not the same, you know, when you study uh, disease and pathology, you, you understand where there's a particular point where it could go either way. Uh, sometimes it doesn't heal, but when that's healed, that's what you call a clean leper. Right. In other words, that means that they are white basically all over. But when there were splotches, you know, when there were these splotches and blotches and the sign was shown to Moses with his hand into his bosom. And when he took his hand out, it turned to his other flesh. But here's what we want to touch on, brothers and sisters, because we probably have to do a third part to really touch on um, 
So we're going to skip over the modern day observation um, of, uh, you know, the modern day observ observation, which has to do with killing of chickens and stuff like that. And that's all because the Jews who call themselves Jews refuse to receive Yeshua, Yehoshua, the majority of them, as the Moshia, right? As the Moshia. So we'll skip over some of those. You can find more in Hebrew for Christians. Because we wanted to touch on uh, 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 Yom Kippur and the New Covenant. It's very important for us to understand Yom Kippur in the light of the New Covenant. But before we can go there properly, we should go over, as we are doing here, the Old Covenant. So we can get a good groundation, right, in the Old Covenant, right? So now, there's the Torah obs uh, uh, observance, right? Now... We are not under the law. We are in laws. We are under grace. Let's just keep that in mind. Right? But now how do we overstand this grace? We need to have an overstanding of the law. Right? We need to have over so do we know what he fulfilled. So he fulfills the role of high priest. Now let's explain. Every year on the month known as Tishri 10, the 10th day of the month of Tishri, the the Kohen Gadol or the Kahen Ha Gadol, which is the high priest or the big priest, he would perform a special ceremony to purge defilement from the tabernacle, the Mishkan, or the temple later on, which was the Beit Ha Mikdash, right? The Beit Ha Mikdash, as well as from the people of Israel. So he would cleanse the holy place, the holy space whether it was a tabernacle in the earlier part, the Mishkan, or later on the Beit Ha Mikdash, the temple made out of stone in later, day, in later times, the Solomon's temple and then the, the second temple, which is actually Herod's temple. Anyway, Leviticus chapter 16 goes into more detail of what is the, the special ceremony that the priests would perform. Now, in addition to the regular, there were regular daily offerings. Remember, this is the role of the Levitical priests who were had a hereditary priests. And they had two types of priests. One was the Levites, the hereditary priests. And then you had the, um, the regular Kohanim. This is similar within the redeemed Beta Ethiopian Hebrew to the Bahitawi, right? And the Deptera. In fact, the word Deptera in the Ge'ez actually mean tabernacle, right? The word deptera, a very interesting study as there as well. Just putting that there as a note and hopefully we'll have more time to go into that for those who are interested. But in particular, there were daily, regular daily offerings, right? And what were these daily offerings that the uh, Kahin HaGadol would, would, would present? He would bring a bull and two goats, right? As a special offering. And the bull will be sacrificed to purge the Mishkan. So the bull was used to sacrifice the Mish, uh, purge the Mishkan or the temple from defilements caused by misdeeds of the priests and their households. Because the family, their families also were part of that priestical establishment under the old covenant, Leviticus 16.6. He would sprinkle the blood of the bull inside the veil of the Holy of Holies. Upon the caporet, right? And the caporet is the cover of the Ark of the Covenant that you see right here. The cover, the caporot, right? Well, they call it the mercy seat, but more correctly, it should be called the place of atonement, right? The place of atonement or the covering that has to do with the atonement. He would sprinkle the blood of the bull inside the veil of the Holy of Holies upon the caporet the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, then he would draw lots, right? He would almost like roll the dice, in other words. And he would select one of the two goats to be the chatiat meswait, or the sin offering, on behalf of the people. Now, this goat, the one that was to be the sin offering on the behalf of the people, was designated as le adonai or la adonai. Le Adonai, which was to Yahweh, which was to the Lord. 
he would likewise enter into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of the goat upon the caporet. Now, note that the idea that the Kahin, no, the Kohen, Kahin Gadol, had a rope that was tied to his ankle in case he had died, like uh, he might have died, and he performed these duties, right? Some say is a medieval legend, is likely a med medieval legend, right? Perhaps they say this because there was no, um, well, there's no testimony from scripture, right? But the question is, what would happen? But th this, is, this is why we have to see the awesomeness of what was going on, right? Finally, right? That's just a little note. We'll just study that up and find out if it's a medieval legend or not, right? Finally, the high priest would lay both hands. Now it's the high priest here, right? And let's bring the high priest right here. It's the high priest, right? That would lay both hands, right? And this is where we get that 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 Trinity sign, actually, you know, is pertaining to the Holy of Holies, right? Finally, the high priest would lay both hands upon the head of the second goat that was designated La Azazel, La Azazel, or for Azazel, right? This is this, the second goat was for Azazel. And it's upon this goat that he would confess all the transgressions, right? All the transgressions of the people. Now, this goat, which was the second goat, which is later to be called the scapegoat, was then driven away into the wilderness, carrying on it all the iniquities, all the rebellions, all the trespasses to a land that was not inhabited. In other words, to an uninhabited wasteland. That's almost like when we read about how certain fallen angels and demons were cast into like a great pit, like where there was nothing, a barrenness, a place of barrenness. Like it says, like the rebellious dwell in a dry land. That's the same idea that we have. So the goat was driven away into the wilderness, carrying on it all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, Leviticus 16.22. Now, according to other teachings that are known as Talmud. Talmud basically means teaching. When they say a Babylonian Talmud, they're talking about a particular type of doctrine or teaching. The word Talmud just means teaching. The Talmudim are the name for the Hebrew for disciples. But according to the teaching, right, a scarlet cord was tied around the neck of the scapegoat that was reported to have turned white as the goat was led away from the city. Now, according to the Talmud, they tell us that a scarlet cord was tied around the neck of the scapegoat that was reported to have turned white. So you see the connection with the Mesora there, turned white as the goat was led away from the city. However, the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, Right, the last forty years. This is after the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the the, the resurrection, right, of Yeshua HaMashiach and and his ascension as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, in the earlier tradition, it is taught that that scarlet cord that was tied around the neck of the scapegoat, it, it was reported to have turned white, right, that scarlet cord, as the goat was led away. But they say that within the last 40 years before the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, this type of a scarlet cord failed to change colors. And that's another sign right there. I mean, for ones who need a sign, that's a very clear sign and indication because the perfect sacrifice that fulfilled Abba Father Yahweh's will was already given. He gave that on behalf of the people, only asking that they have faith in his well-beloved son in whom he's well pleased to hear him because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of ha elohim now there was a role of the people when the high priest performed these functions the people would fast in eager anticipation of the outcome of the rituals after completing his task the garments of the high priest were covered 
were bloody, were covered in blood, according to Leviticus 6 and 27. Only after this did Yahweh accept the sacrifice. This is according to one Midrash, one study, one teaching. Um, as the high priest hung out his garments, a miracle took place and his garments turned from blood stain, crimson to white. And some say this is the teaching behind what Isaiah 1 and 18 says, right? Isaiah 1 and 18. So there were what one will call supernatural signs. They're not really only supernatural that man has fallen. If man had not fallen, he would recognize that these so-called signs he calls supernatural are the outworkings, right, of a loving Abba, right, a loving father. Now, in three separate passages in Torah, right, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, are told that the 10th day of the seventh month, Tishri, is the day of atonement. It shall be a sacred, a holy occasion or convocation for you all. You all shall afflict your souls. And we have Leviticus 16, 29 to 34, Leviticus 23, 16, 23, 26 to 32 and numbers 29 7 to 11 now this is the only holy day of the of Yahweh's Moedim of the Hebrew holidays or the Israelitish holidays of the year where some say fasting is explicitly commanded by Yahweh we say affliction of his soul afflicts to afflict one's soul is more explained by Isaiah 58, where he questions what kind of fast is this that they were fasting. It's also called a Shabbat Shabbaton, right? Or a day of complete abstention from any kind of mundane work. Now, remember, we're studying this initially from the basis of the Old Covenant, right? So this teaching here, this would be the second part touching on the old covenant types, right? Before now we, before, before we get into the fulfillment in Yeshua, in our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and through him and through the lamb who, who he is, as well as our high priest, right? So it is enlightening to note that the sequence of this holy day in relation to the time of preparation that we have in the previous month, the month of Elul, right? According to the Hebrew and the activities that surround Rosh, or Ras Ha Shana, leading up to Yom Kippur, as Tesuriel Sariet Ken. First, Elohim, he commands that we repent, that we turn around to Shuba, right? Or return to him in earnestness of heart, consciousness. And then he provides, right, the means, he provides, once we turn around, he provides the means of reconciliation, or that at one meant, right? At one mind, Yeshua HaMoshia, the only mediator between Ha Elohim and man, at his Tau, right? His Tau, his mark, his cross. And thus, once again, is fulfilled the finding of the true cross and the binding.